I started off early in life being raised up in East Alabama with a, a, a great desire to be a success in life, and I equated success with making a lot of money. Uh, and when I went to I went to Auburn University, and then after getting my basic degree there, I went to law school at the University of Alabama and met a fellow student on my first week in law school. And he had this student, fellow student I met, had the same desire that I did to be a big success in life. And uh, so we, we, we sat up until about 2 o'clock in the morning. We met each other about 7 o'clock at night. We sat up until 2 o'clock in the morning and decided to be law partners and business partners. And, uh, and, we, went and we established a, 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 a mission statement. And our, and our enterprise was only a few hours old. But we decided we wanted a mission statement. It was simple, easy to remember. Uh, our mission statement was simply to get rich. Uh, <laughs> that, that was our mission statement. And, and for the next eight years, we devoted every waking hour to getting rich. Uh, and we sold all kind of products, and I won't have time to, to tell you the details. But uh, even when, when I was a student, we were making $50,000 a year as students uh, in our various business ventures. And then we went to Montgomery, Alabama, uh, and continued our business ventures, had a law practice. Uh, we only practiced law for about two years because the business was growing so fast, we didn't have time to practice law. And so we closed up our law business and uh, pursued this direct mail publishing business. And uh, it was phenomenally successful. Uh, we sold uh, tractor cushions, we sold uh, 20 train carloads, carloads of tractor cushions in one three month period, made enough money to buy a building. Then we got into publishing cookbooks, became the largest publisher of cookbooks in the United States, selling them by the millions. Then we sold all kinds of other products and got all of the things that money will get for you. In the meantime, while I was a senior, still at law school, I married Linda, and we moved to the capital city of Alabama. I ensconced her in a beautiful house, got a Lincoln Continental Drive, cabin on the lake, two speed boats, 10 horses, 2,000 acres of land, servants. Uh, as we say in the South, we were wading in high cotton. Uh, but uh, she had everything but no husband because I worked all the time. And sometimes I would even sleep at the office. I'd come home and eat, go back and work, stay on the, lay on the sofa and sleep a few hours, get up and work because I was in a headlong rush uh, to get rich. And uh, even when I, my treasurer came in and told me I was worth a million dollars, I said, okay, let's go for 10 now. Uh, and, and that was the way my life was at that point. I took, uh, at that time I was keeping a diary and I would make entries and I calculated how much I was making per minute. Uh, I, I was keeping a run break. I'm, I'm making so much a minute now and then I want to make more for, per minute. Um, but I paid a price for that because uh, my wife uh, and I, even though uh, as a very young woman, uh, she had everything from a material standpoint, but she didn't have a husband. And uh, the inevitable happened, we drifted apart. Uh, she ended up leaving me, going to New York City. Our marriage hung in the balance. And uh, finally she agreed to see me, uh, but she wanted to wait a, a while. And uh, we had a, a man in our company who was a pilot and I rented a, an airplane. And, uh, I, and I told this guy, and of course, he didn't know, nobody uh, in the company knew about the personal crisis I was going through. But I told him, I said, let's go to Niagara Falls. And he said, what do you want to go there for? I said, I've just never been. I'd like to go see it. So he said, okay, it's your money. And uh, so we took off for Niagara Falls. And uh, as we were coming into Niagara Falls, uh, we almost crashed into a commercial airliner. That was a sobering thing. But... Uh, uh, we landed and went over on the Canadian side and got a hotel room and we were watching television. And uh, there was a program on about a young woman uh, who had gone to China as a missionary. And uh, she met a young officer in the Chinese army. And uh, they fell in love with each other and, and they were contemplating getting married. But this officer realized if he married an American Christian missionary woman, that would end his career in the Chinese army. And he went to an old village leader and he said, I got a problem. I'm a career officer in the Chinese army. My career is very important to me, but I've met this wonderful young woman that I'm in love with and I want to marry her, but I know if I married her, it's going to be the end of my career in the Chinese army. What should I do? And as the camera zeroed in on this old village leader's face, he said these words. 
a planned life can only be endured. And they just jumped out of the screen at me because at that point in my life, it was planned. And my plan was to get richer and richer and richer and richer and be buried in the rich part of the Montgomery, Alabama Cemetery. <laughs> that, was, that was my planned life. And, uh, and I got to thinking that, uh, you know, maybe, and of course, as I said, we had become the largest publisher of cookbooks in the world. We were selling cookbooks by the millions. And having been raised up in a Christian home, I had the Bible and all of that teaching uh, in my makeup. Uh, and I got to thinking to myself, you know, no matter what I do in life, one day it's going to come to an end. It's like the life of all of us comes to an end. It doesn't, life on this earth doesn't last forever. In fact, it's pretty short. <laughs> but I thought, one day I'm going to stand before the God who created me, and he's going to say, what did you do with the gift of life I gave you? And I could hear myself say, Lord, I sold a hell of a lot of cookbooks. <laughs> <laughs> and I wondered how impressed he would be. <laughs> really began to think if I could report to the Lord who created me that one day I was out in a poor neighborhood in a rural area and I found a family they didn't have an outhouse and I built them an outhouse and I thought that might be a report that would be more impressive to the God who had created me. So Linda agreed finally to see me, and I went to New York with all of this swirling in my head. And uh, fortunately, we were reconciled. A lot of confession on both sides, a lot of tears, a lot of uh, very emotional uh, turmoil. But the end result of all of it was a decision on the part of us to fundamentally and drastically change and get off the path of the planned life that we had. And we decided to extend our spiritual antenna and pick up God's message for us and see maybe what was the right path for us from God's point of view. And we felt very strongly that in order to do what we felt we should do, that in our situation, we should divest ourselves of our wealth. And so we decided to give, to sell the company and to give every penny of it away and to get rid of our 2,000 acres of land and our horses and our cattle and our speedboats and give it all away. And of course, when we went back home and told family and friends what we decided, they all thought we'd had a mental breakdown. <laughs> Even, even the pastor who had counseled with us uh, <laughs> thought we were nuts. <laughs> and I said, Pastor, but don't you know the Bible? It says it's difficult for the rich to get into the kingdom. And, uh, you know, and he said, yeah, but you got to be practical. <laughs> he didn't believe his own message. <laughs> but I said, I think in our situation, this is what God wants us to do. And we were led to a small Christian community near America's Georgia, corner near farm, and met Clarence Jordan, a man I'd never heard of in my life. And he became our spiritual mentor. He ended up being the person closest to Jesus of anyone I had ever known. And uh, <clears throat> he had a profound impact uh, on our thinking. And the consequence of that is a ministry emerged out of this uh, change in our lives, a ministry emerged out of it which uh, uh, initially involved the building of one house, uh, one house for one family, the Johnson family, uh, near America's Georgia. And then after working almost five years there in that rural, obscure corner of southwest Georgia, we became missionaries in Africa. And we worked for three years uh, in what was Zaire at that time, the old Belgian Congo. Today it's called the Democratic Republic of the Congo. 
And we built 114 houses in the capital city of Bandaka, and then we went to the southern part of the region and started 300 more houses, and came back to America's Georgia and back to Cornelia in 1976. And sitting on the floor of an old abandoned chicken barn, uh, we had uh, the first meeting of Habitat Humanity. And over the years, people have asked me, uh, Miller, when you started Habitat for Humanity, did you ever think it was going to become the huge organization that it has become? I got out the old minutes that we had. We wrote handwritten minutes on that, in that first meeting where we were sitting on the floor of the chicken barn. You know what we wrote in the minutes of that first meeting? Our first goal is to build housing for a million people. And we were just a tiny little group of people sitting around on the floor. And that goal was achieved in August of 2005. 